So I'd like to say a little bit about uh, how I came to the insights that I'm going to be sharing with you and how I came to be doing this talk here today. Um, I met my meditation teacher, Sri Eknathishwaran, uh, the same year that I became a professor at Berkeley. So I was immediately launched on two diverging careers, which split my personality permanently. So I had rather a hard time for nigh on to 25 years trying to make my work that I had to do for a living and my obligation that I had to graduate students relevant for me. You know, something that I could really get interested in because to teach something as difficult as Greek and not really quite be there 100% would be impossible. So fortunately, Greek is extremely engaging and a beautiful language and extremely wise authors. Um, but I also had to kind of figure out how this related to my other passion, which was nonviolence. And boy, did I find out uh, a lot, a lot of stuff. And I actually uh, published an article that came out in 1990, which was, uh, it was controversial. It was kind, kind of groundbreaking. It was the kind of thing that classic scholars don't usually do because what what I almost said we, <laughs> what they do is they look for details within the text as though the text were composed for their benefit, forgetting that the text was composed to organize a civilization. And so all the values are going to be embedded in that. So uh, it was a, a long, delightful study that led to, well, I think I actually believe this may be hubris, and if so, a lightning bolt will sure, surely come through your ceiling, Carrie, and take, take, put me out of my misery. But I actually think that I discovered the core of what Homer was interested in and why he became a, an oral poet and performed this particular text, what, what it really was about. And here in the West, in the modern era, any time after middle of the 12th century, our interest in the poem centers around the reunion with Penelope. And that is a very romantic moment. And if you don't know the themes and what's going on, you can just take it as a kind of a pretty good Hollywood movie. And that becomes the climax of the poem for us. But I came to realize that the climax of the poem is the murder of the suitors in his home and what it means and what it means for him and for society. And that makes a lot more sense for epic because epic was not the genre where you sing about love. You remember Achilles in the beginning of the Iliad, his, he has an eikmalotes, a spear captured woman, and his commander in chief takes her away and it just about destroys uh, the Achaean army. And they ask him at one point, what's the big deal? It's just, she's nothing. Oligonte, but she's my nothing, and he took her away. So that's what, I'll have other things to say about womankind in Homer, where I think you'll see with that, we have indeed made a little progress since the uh, latter part of the eighth century BC, which is when we figure this particular performance was composed. And I keep referring to it as a performance because Homer did not compose in writing. He composed uh, standing up at festivals using traditional material which he had imbibed over years and years of practice. And people still do that in the modern world. So that's how I came to focus on what I'm going to be sharing with you about the Odyssey, which I, in, uh, in all modesty, think is kind of the key to this epic, which means it's pretty important for Western civilization. So the, the name of my article, as you can see, this is a pretty well-worn edition. The name of my article was The Pro-Am and the Problem, because uh, what I want to do is go over the proem, which is the first 10 lines of the poem, and then read some select lines in Book 21 and some in Book 22. In the course of doing that, I think the theme is going to come out sooner or later. So uh, we happened, we're very lucky, we have 
not, there are only two full epics in this genre from archaic Greek, but we have four proems because there are two proems that were saved uh, in other contexts. And from those four, a scholar named uh, Barent van Groningen discovered that they all have a very regular pattern. And that makes sense because you, it's, you don't hand out a, uh, uh, the score. You know, to, as you come into the theater, you're not given a score to follow the epic. So you come in and you don't know what epic it's going to be. And they have a very succinct way of telling you what is the main story and what part of it they're going to start from. Uh, and that's all wrapped up in 10 lines. And it's even done, it's specific down to the point where after the introduction, Andra Moyanipa sing to me about a hero, there's a relative clause that tells the inner part of the poem. And then it comes back. And at the end, he says, Ton hamo ten from taking, looking at the whole thing, goddess, start from here. Goes on. So uh, we, <clears throat> many people know <clears throat> in the field that uh, how to read a proem and exactly what it's going to tell you in terms of the content. But I was a comparative literature major. <clears throat> it was thoroughly uh, polluted by theory. <laughs> <laughs> and I came to realize, and I don't think anyone had done this before, that the proem in the hands of a really skilled performer, I want to say something about that in a second, will also tell you not just the content, but the concerns. What are the themes and why is the story important? Uh, this is... I mean, I've read poetry of many kinds in about eight or nine languages. And I think, you know, the Homeric poems are, if not the very best, they're really on the short list, you know, with Dante and a few others. What it takes to have a really great literature is a genius and a tradition. And Homer was whoever he was, as one colleague of mine said, this poem was composed either by Homer or somebody else of the same name. <laughs> and since we know absolutely nothing about him except his name, that <laughs> shows you where we're at. But he was obviously a genius. Let me leap ahead. I mean, as you can guess, I've never done this before. What we're about to do here, it usually took me 16 weeks <laughs> to go through this and trying to compress it into 90 minutes. But so uh, let me leap around a little bit anyway. Uh, you probably are roughly familiar with how the poem unfolds content-wise. Uh, we're, we're in Ithaca and, uh, well, we're not in Ithaca yet. We're, uh, t the, the gods are worrying about Odysseus. He is entrapped on the island of uh, Calypso. Her name means the hider. Some names uh, in the epics are very easy to interpret, others are not. Penelope means wood duck, and nobody's <laughs> figured there's nothing particularly duck-like. She likes her pet geese a lot, but there's nothing particularly duck-like about her. So, um, and uh, he is, uh, Zeus sends Hermes to rescue Odysseus. Hermes orders Calypso to let him go. They've been shacked up hanging out together, having a meaningful relationship, as meaningful as mythological relationships can be for, you know, years now. She's reluctant to let him go. He insists that she do it. He builds a raft and sets out on the sea. A terrific Poseidon hates him. Athena loves him. We don't know why. Uh, Poseidon sends a storm to wreck his raft. He says, Oh, moi ago, tida moi me kista genetai. What's now what's going to happen? You know, look at all the stuff I've gone through and now what? And he lands on the island uh, of Scaria and his raft has been broken apart and he's hanging onto a rock like a, a, a polyp, you know, a, an octopus. And he sees land. I think the only time that I can remember that he says anything that's not true in the outer world is in the famous adventure that you're probably all familiar with. And it's, 
It's probably the most popular folk tale in the world where Odysseus and his men are trapped in a cave which is inhabited by a monster called Polyphemus who has, is not a vegetarian, let's, let's put it that way. <laughs> and uh, so as here, here comes the guest friendship ritual. You know, even though this person is a monster, they have to follow the same rituals. And so when, when Odysseus sees him, he's about 12 feet tall, he looks like he stepped out of a horror movie. His speech has about 10 words for, the, for guest friend in about three lines. Do you remember guest friendship? Zeus, Zeus, remember Zeus? <laughs> and uh, now, but that doesn't cut any mustard with uh, Polyphemus. The only time Odysseus lies is Polyphemus comes to the point and says, okay, now who are you? And Odysseus says, my name is Uteus, which means nobody. And so then when they're blinding Polyphemus and all his friends come around, because Polyphemus is hollering, you can imagine it makes a loud noise in that cave, all his friends come around. And they say, what's the matter? Who's hurting you? And he says, nobody's hurting me. <laughs> they say, then what's your problem for gosh sakes? Go back to sleep, leave us alone. So outside of that one cunning trick, he tells the truth in the world of falsehood and falsehoods in the world of truth. And that tends to knot them together again in a way of commenting on them, each one commenting. So, uh, I was saying, and this is pretty close to my main point, that the proem actually is about the suitors, but it's about the mantic shadow of the suitors and not the actual flesh and blood suitors. And you'll notice that each band, the crew that's out there with Odysseus and the suitors that are eating him out of house and home back home in Ithaca, each of those bands has a ringleader. It's a, um, Antinous uh, at home and a fellow named Eurylochus out in the outer world. And he has trouble with uh, both of them. Uh, let's see. Okay, I think that's all that I wanted to say about how those two sections of the poem relate. Uh, now, to give you a little bit of a background of the setting and where we are in social history, the poem describes a world which is based on the oikos, which is where we get our word economy, and it means the home, uh, the homestead. And we are not yet in a world which is based on the polis, or which is where we get our word political, and that means city. There's only one place in the Odyssey where you have a few budding institutions that look like you might be heading in the direction of a polis. And that is again in Phaeacia, where there are some buildings that are specially designated for having meetings. Once you have a meeting hall, you have a political community that is over and above the individual clans and the family. Now the world that started before you get to Oikos organization does raise its ugly head in the poem, and that is a world of uh, basically warlords, you know, clan, clan loyalties. And uh, incidentally, one of the things that kind of programmed me to realize what is really significant to Homer happened when I was 12 years old, a long time ago, and I was in my family home, my oikos, up in upstate New York, and it was the McCarthy era. And this was very scary for me, even more scary than the Holocaust had been, because in the Holocaust I was too young to know what was going on. But in the McCarthy era, we were all Jewish school teachers in this community, and we were being picked off by McCarthy, and I really did not know what was going on. I was scared. I was walking across the living room of my house. We had this old-fashioned radio was playing and the announcer was going on and on about loyalty, you know, loyalty, loyalty. And suddenly, I don't know where this came from, it just hit me like a bolt from the blue, as they say, that if loyalty to the nation is good, why shouldn't loyalty to the whole world be better? 
And for 40 years, nobody told me any reason why <laughs> it wouldn't be better. <laughs> and in fact, that's what we're dealing with here, is which unit are you loyal to? So you may be surprised, for example, in the Iliad, and sometimes these things that are so out of sync with our world and our expectations, they go by and we don't notice them. But when Achilles uh, and Patroclus are talking just before one of the final battles of the Iliad, Achilles says, I wish every single one of our companions here, the Achaeans, were killed, and the only ones left were you and me, and we could sack Troy ourselves because we would get more glory that way. <laughs> So, you know, the loyalty to the, you know, to what? There is no nation state called Greece. It just happens to be an expeditionary force. They know they have a common language and they worship common gods, but there isn't any nation. And that's why when the Persians arrived, it was very, very difficult to get people together and fight them off because the Persians actually had about a third of the Greek city-states on their side, just to offer them more money. So the, what is the terrible thing that the suitors are doing that merits them being killed? That is, a, I'm going to just actually ask you that question. What's, what's so, what are they doing that's so terribly wrong? And there's many answers to this, and they all cohere. Destroying the home. Mm-hmm. They're destroying the home, and they're destroying something called the biotos. Okay, now bios means life. Er. Hope that's still legible. Bios means life. That's where we get the word biology. There, plant biology. Got it. <laughs> uh, the word bios means life, the word bios means bow. And incidentally, we have a, uh, an artifact from the Odyssey right here. Uh, at the end of my talk, we're all going to try stringing it. <laughs> <laughs> and whoever does it gets the cookies. <laughs> oh, I thought they were going to get to marry me. Yeah, <laughs> I was just being a little too discreet, Carrie. <laughs> We also have to take over the house. You realize that. Yeah. <laughs> if you have any pets, they're there now ours. Yeah. <laughs> so as I was saying, bios means life and bios means bow. And Heraclitus, who was the most brilliant of the Greek philosophers, said, oh, bow, your name is life, but your work is death. <laughs> so biotos is a word based on bios, and it means your life substance. So the fact that, and they keep saying this, you're eating up our biotos. Basically, it's almost tantamount to saying you're killing us. Because without their possessions and their, their nourishment, they have, they're not, they, their life has no meaning. They have no life. They're dying. But doesn't Telemachus, at least in this translation, say something like, uh, they've been eating this, they've been eating that, and mm -hmm. pretty soon they're going to, they're, they'll be... They'll end up eating me. Am I the only one who noticed that? Um, he, he wouldn't use the expression, they're eating me, but he may mean, he may say something like, they're they destroying. Finish me off. They'll finish me off, mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, there's a savage uh, irony about that because <laughs> the suitors speculate about uh, Telemachus going out on his expedition and not coming back, which happens in that family a lot. <laughs> And they say, boy, then wouldn't we have a job of work going through all his possessions? Mm -hmm. Then there's the, the work theme. Like instead of, there's twice there, the po various characters say, you're not only eating me out of house and home, you're doing it ne poinoi without paying. Mm -hmm. And they say, then they say, boy, it'll, not only are they not working to add to his wealth, which is how the oikos works, well, the outlying people who are not part of the central household, they give their wealth, excess wealth anyway, goes to the oikos for redistribution. That's the system. And you might notice that in Book 21, 
Penelope says, okay, okay, you guys, I'm convinced I should marry one of you. This is very ironic. We have no idea how seriously we're supposed to take this and what she does know and what she doesn't know. But she says, uh, go out and bring me marriage gifts, you know, a dowry. All you guys go out there and bring gifts in. Now, what is she doing? She's actually restarting the oikos. It's a, it's a stimulus package. <laughs> you know, just this is where probably Obama got the idea. <laughs> so uh, they are supposed to be adding to his wealth and with their work. And what they say is when he's dead, our work will really increase because their work is destroying his work, his wealth, his life substance. So in mythological terms, this is made into an extremely serious uh, crime. Remember how the proem ends, the fools, napioi. I mean, there's hardly a word in this poem which isn't ironic. I mean, this is just ice cream for comparative lit people. <laughs> <laughs> napioi also means children. It literally means those who don't have speech yet. Ne epos, ne poinoi. It means children, or when applied to adults, it means fools, which is on the edge of being criminals. There's, you know, in a modern court of law, if you come in and say, oh, your honor, I'm so terribly sorry, you get a much lower penalty. But in Greek terms, it did not make any difference. You know, you did what you did. Um, it's a shame culture, not a guilt culture. And uh, if you don't understand something, it's tantamount to being morally inadequate. So it's this word atasthalia. It's really too bad that we don't totally sure we understand what that word means, but it seems to come from a word ate, which means moral blindness. So that's why they say a culpable folly in some way. Can you say just a little bit more about the difference between the shame culture and the guilt culture? Yes. Uh, in a guilt culture, you refrain from doing something wrong because you would be ashamed of it. And that shame comes from others. Whereas in a guilt culture, you refrain from doing it because you yourself sense that it's wrong. And there's kind of an interesting line somewhere in between Homer and Plato, where culture, the culture actually grows and reaches a deeper understanding of what goes on inside the person. So at the time, I mean, in, inside the poem, we're mm -hmm. talking about a shame culture? Yeah, okay. it's pretty much a shame culture throughout. So only if you get caught are you ashamed? Uh, yes, but don't forget you might get caught by one of the gods. And right. <laughs> so it really is hard to okay. escape. But you won't feel anything wrong unless you're, unless you're seen and it's reflected back to you. Mm. Yeah. So in that culture, if you can get away with something, then it's okay? Well, it's okay in the sense that, uh, yeah, you got away with it. Uh, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. Not very relaxing. Yeah. Well, and were the Greek gods supposed to be omniscient? I mean, no. No, so they didn't know no. everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so the gods don't shame humans. They kill them. Because <laughs> it seemed like in the poem there's some evidence that they say shaming things to them. Yeah, they say disgraceful things to them. And. Uh, Oh, uh, so so does Theoclymenus, the seer. He comes in and says, you fools, you don't know what you're doing. I see you as dead already. But the suitors are perfect fools. They, they just go on and you remember, even after Odysseus has shot Antinous dead right in front of them, they say, wow, that was a stupid thing to do. What, what do you think you're doing here? You must be a really bad bow shooter. <laughs> and Odysseus says, you kunas, you dogs, don't you recognize me yet? And incidentally, note that to recognize Odysseus is to recognize his violence. Mm -hmm. You're saying more about yeah, that well. violence. Yeah. Uh, that's how they know it's him. 
Euryclea knows it's him because he has a scar on his thigh. Penelope knows it's him because he knows about their bed, which is rather special. <laughs> and the suitors know about him because they know it's him because he's about to kill them. So they, they recognize him by thematic identity. Other people recognize him by his moniker, which is, I'm the guy who suffered a lot on the sea. So, you know, they, that's how you aim Odysseus, Laertes, host, possibly, Ponoa, I'm forgetting how the rest of that line goes, shamefully. Fortunately, this is a guilt culture, not a shame culture. Posse uh, Delosio, I'm known for many guiles and I suffered much on the sea. So he doesn't just, he names who his personal name is, his father's name is, and then his thematic identity as a hero. Okay. So it seems to me I asked you a question. What is, so we've pretty much got it with the suitors are doing wrong. They are basically turning the Oikos system on its head by uh, depleting instead of adding to uh, the wealth. But when you step back and you don't think about it as a myth or a political ideology, really what's so terrible? I mean, the guy has been gone for 20 years. Nobody has heard a word. Of course, how would you? But, <laughs> but nobody has heard a word about him. He, the, the whole, what should we call the island of Ithaca? The whole demos, the whole entity, the community, is stalled. It's like what Greece is going through right now. <laughs> they, the economy isn't working. They point, they point out that nobody has called an assembly. No one has called a meeting for 20 years. And, and Telemachus calls it. And he says, who called this meeting? Why are we, why are we here? Uh, so everything is dead in the water. And uh, what's so terrible, really, from a non-mythological point of view, in saying, let's start this thing up again. Let's get Penelope a new husband, start bringing wealth back into the house, and we'll have, you know, it's like, what, how would you feel if the king dies, you know? You, in the same breath, you say the king is dead, long live the king, because you don't want to have that seat vacated. And that's the only form of organization that they have. And it's the only thing that's saving them from blood feuds. I, I put a name down here. René Girard, he uh, was a literary scholar who uh, made a big name for himself with a book called Violence and the Sacred, in which he showed that sacrificial practice and sacrificial uh, dynamics are a code for group violence. The reason these communities are constantly sacrificing animals is not just because they want to eat them. All you would have to do is butcher them in order to eat them, and you don't have to go through this whole fantastic thing of pretending that the animal violated some terrible code, and then they ask the sheep, do you, are you okay with being sacrificed? And they sprinkle a little water on the sheep's head. Now, if you have a dog or maybe a sheep, you know what it'll do. It'll go like this. <laughs> and that happens to be the way you say no in Greek. So, all of this fantastic uh, rigmarole uh, is because you're keeping alive the code for group violence. So that when a troublemaker comes up, you go count the potsherds and you say, Socrates, you've got to drink hemlock. So the, there's a tremendous discovery that Girard made. And uh, he wrote about seven or eight books. They all mostly say the same thing. So I'm going to recommend the shortest one, <laughs> which is Job, the victim of his people. I'd really recommend for general purposes, because we still have rituals going on that are still encoding uh, violence. One of them is called, I hope I'm not offending anyone, one of them is called the National Football League. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. but as one of my students said in my Greek religion class, uh, I said, once you've heard about this stuff, you see it everywhere. It really is a key to a lot of things that are going on. 
So, how about now we go back to the last line of the proem? The, the bloody fools, the guilty people, they ate the cattle of the sun. That story is actually told uh, in book 12. They come to an island. It's the island of uh, Trinacia, which might be Sicily. It has three corners, Trinacia. That's what the Sicilians think, at least. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, uh, most of Italy below, oh, say from Ostia on down, was Greek at one point. And the, the, the Greek-speaking Italians speak a Greek which is very similar to ancient Greek, more than to modern Greek. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can hear kind of funny pronunciation from those guys. They're not Homeric, maybe, but, you know, maybe Hellenistic. Greek? Yeah. So back to our story. This is very Homeric, by the way. You take these long digressions <laughs> and you come back. Back to our story. The men are starving. So is Odysseus, but he has self-control and they don't. Remember the sirens episode? Uh, they f go past this island where this seductive music is being played and many men have been lured to their death. You can see their bones bleaching on the shore. Odysseus, he has them all plug their ears up with wax. Then they run out of wax. So he says, okay, tie me to the mast. And he goes by, he hears the song. And he says, you know, he, he motions to the men, untie me. <laughs> but but they're, they're savvy enough not to do that. Uh, so anyway, finally, after many adventures, and in each adventure, people get killed. If I don't lose the thread, I want to go back to the cave of Polyphemus for a minute. They finally, by a very clever ruse and a huge violence, they manage to escape from Polyphemus's cave. They pile into the boats. They're rowing away from the shore. And Odysseus takes it into his head to do what? Has anyone read this recently? Yeah, to taunt, him. to taunt him by declaring his identity. Right. He says, you, you want to know who blinded you? My name isn't Utus. It's Odysseus, son of Laertes, who I suffered much on the sea. And when Polyphemus hears his voice, he picks up a humongous rock and heaves it out. And it goes a little bit too long, and the ship is coming in from the wave, and his men say, shut up, you know, <laughs> let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> and you know, they haven't eaten Odysseus, you know, he's already promised to eat Odysseus last. It's very nice of him. Pumaton, he says, you'll be the last one to go. So the men are terrified and they're furious with him. And uh, then they come to the, uh, he, they, he does get away because the next rock falls short and the ship is pushed out again. I cannot resist telling you a joke at this point. There's only two jokes in classics. Uh, <laughs> this one is about a German seminar and the, the professor asks the students, how come Polyphemus missed the ship? And the, the question is so dumb, they, they don't know what, how, what he's getting at. You know, this is a German university and so he goes on questioning them. He's getting angry and angrier. And finally, they say, we don't know, Professor. Why? He says, no depth perception. He only had one eye. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, but, but Herr Professor, he was blind. They put out that eye. That too, that too. <laughs> <laughs> so you now know half of the classics humor <laughs> repertoire. Um, so it, it's quite important that uh, Odysseus feels that his, Homer, his reputation is more important than the safety of his men, if you want to, you want to read it that way. So he, he doesn't want to go through all of this without Polyphemus knowing who killed him so they can add to his reputation. And incidentally, this is one of the oldest values in epic culture. There's a uh, formula in the Iliad, comes up in particular, Cleosophiton, which means imperishable fame. 
And there's a formula in Sanskrit epics, uh, Shrava Akshitihi, which is syllable for syllable the same words. So we think that probably these formulas were preserved from PIE, Primitive Indo-European Civilization, that went down through the epics into India on the one hand and Homer on the other. There's other examples of that too. Absolutely fascinating. But it, is, it does show how deeply embedded this value might be. So we're finally coming to the island of Thrinakia slash Sicily. And uh, they're becalmed and stuck on the beach. And Odysseus knows that you are not supposed to eat these cattle because they belong to Helios, the sun god. And but then Odysseus goes to sleep. He has a knack of going to sleep at really <laughs> significant times. The most significant one is on his way back when he finally makes the final leg home from Phaeacia to Ithaca, he falls asleep. And they just put him ashore with all of his wealth that they've given him. That is to show that the poet was aware that the mystical world is not a geographical one. It's a world in consciousness. Anyway, they've been told not to eat these cattle. Let me back up a second here. I'm doing a lot of backtracking here. Uh, one of the rituals uh, in which you carried out sacrifice of a bovine was called the bufonia or the ox murder. And the way it worked was you would sprinkle some barley grains on an altar and then draw a sacred circle around the altar, creating what they call a temenos or reserved place. And you announce that nobody is to cross that line. And then you uh, untie an ox. The ox doesn't speak Greek. So it says, oh, barley. And it goes in. Then everyone says, oh, sacrilege. And they sacrifice the ox. And then you have to get rid of the knife, which is guilty of killing the animal. So the person who killed him has to take that knife and run all the way to the seashore and throw it into the sea and then exile himself for another year because he has also taken on some of the guilt. So this is why blood feuding and sacrificial uh, logic is no permanent solution, right, to, to violence. So I, I'm keeping you in suspense, partly by mischief, I think. Uh, here they are on the island of Thet for the Nokia. They're starving. Odysseus is asleep. They say, Psst. the old man's asleep. <laughs> they slaughter the cattle and they want to make it a nice kosher ritual. So you have to have barley and wine, but they have nothing. So they just have water and leaves, which is already pretty bad. But I don't know, does anyone remember the episode well enough? There's a little detail that might go by. What happens to the cattle? Is anyone here from PETA? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is probably one of the most horrible things in the poem, if you really kind of have a sense for the meaning of these rituals. The cattle actually moan in agony, they bellow as they're being roasted on the spits, meaning you didn't really kill them. You didn't kill them because you can't. They're immortal cattle. Now, they neither die nor reproduce. So what does, what does that really mean in mythic logic? Well, I'll save you reading about 10 <laughs> volumes and I'll tell you it means that these cattle are the source animals for real world animals. So in modern economic terms, well, do you remember E.F. Schumacher? Uh, he wrote Small is Beautiful. He said the trouble with our modern economy is that we're exhausting the capital and not living on the interest. You know, we are t taking fossil fuels and not renewables. That is exactly what these cattle stood for. So these men, it's not just like they took somebody else's cows. They are causing irreparable damage to the core of the universe. Napioi. Boy, did they make a mistake. And so they're immediately killed by 
Helios uh, himself. And Odysseus is spared because he was asleep. So what does it mean that he was asleep at that very moment when the universe was being threatened? Well, that's a very, very good question. And I, I sort of leave it up to, up to us to figure that out. What did it mean? Ever since the proem, it's been nagging at us if, if we're listening to a recitation. Why does the poet say four times in ten lines, it wasn't his fault, it wasn't his fault, it wasn't his fault? Because there's a presumption that it was his fault. Mm. And now, as if that weren't enough, shortly after the escape from Polyphemus, the men, who also fall asleep at the wrong moment, no, actually, Odysseus falls asleep and they open the bag of winds and blow themselves off course. Um, the, Theo, uh, Eurylochus says, all these men perished by your criminal folly. And he uses exactly the same line that occurred in the proem, autoi gar, autaisen, atas thaliesen alonto. And he says right to his face, autu gar, autoisen, atas thaliesen alonto. By, by your criminal folly, your own, they perished. So he takes the, the excuses of the proem and reverses them and puts them in Odysseus's face. And do you remember Odysseus's reaction? He almost kills him. They have to, the other men have to just fall on it, even though Eurylochus is somewhat closely related to him, the poet says. Who's killed him? Yeah. Michael. Yes, Stephanie. Uh -huh. And so what, <laughs> what I, I, the idea that comes to me mm -hmm. is, um, didn't you say that there was the one goddess who really loved Odysseus? Mm -hmm. Athena. Athena. So was Homer identifying then with Athena and saying that, you know, yeah, you, he's, if he's portraying Odysseus in this way, that it's not his fault, he's a good boy, <laughs> <laughs> you know, even though he's doing all these terrible mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that is uh, very possible, and I actually came to believe this, and this is what I wanted to share with you. I'm finished with the next sentence, we can all go home. Uh, Homer is not for Odysseus or against Odysseus, he's simply portraying Odysseus. And when he's portraying Odysseus, what does that mean? Um, try, trying to, like, how can I really, you know, pull out a good summary of this? Okay. On the island uh, of Ithaca, modern-day Ithaca is probably not the Ithaca that Homer was thinking of, but on modern-day Ithaca, there is a, a bay called Polis Bay. And in Paulus Bay, about 50 years ago, people discovered a cave that was submerged. As it happened to a lot of, some of your best caves are submerged <laughs> in, in Homer. And so they held their nose and went down into the cave and came up with a number of items. And one of them was a pot shirt, about yay big, with about three letters on the top and four letters on the bottom. And it says, Cain dus. So they know that it must have meant Eukain Odyssei, which means this was a votive offering to Odysseus, which means Odysseus was worshipped as a heros. I'm, but I'm not just showing off, I'm having to use a different word here. He was worshipped as a cult hero in that part of the world. And uh, a heros is a person of supernormal power. They actually don't quite die. You have to propitiate them after they have passed on. And they are, their, their power, I think I'm finally getting it to come together here. Their power is both wonderful and terrible. They alone can save you from external dangers, but internally they're not much of a picnic. Uh, you may be aware of a play called The Madness of Heracles. Heracles is the most heroic of all heroes. <laughs> Incidentally, 
I was sitting at a lecture one time and I was sitting next to Professor, Professor Jaini, who is a Jain you know, from India. And uh, the, the lecturer said, in all of Greek mythology, there is only one mortal who ever became immortal, and that's Heracles. And Professor Jaini said, only one, oh my goodness. <laughs> 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 anyway, back to our story. <laughs> and my excuse for doing this is Homer himself. Back to my story, Heracles goes mad and thinks that his family are his enemies and slaughters them. He takes his famous bow and he kills his wife, his children, servants, everybody. There's also a story uh, which is passed on as though it is historical about a hero who comes back because he hasn't been properly propitiated and goes into a gymnasium, you know, a gym. I don't know if you've seen that cartoon. Uh, it's a roadside sign. It says, last yoga studio for 1.5 miles. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the caption is a California freeway. <laughs> anyway, he goes into some kind of a gymnasium where the young children are being trained in athletics. And he does kind of a Samson thing, pushes the columns out and thing crashes kills all these children. So heroes, uh, you know, their, their, their power, again, they can be, they can rescue, they, they alone can rescue the community, but let loose within the community, they are a nightmare. Is that like, I'm thinking of Achilles as another archetypal hero, would mm -hmm. his destructive thing be like withholding and the destruction that happened? Because he never did any, like Achilles never ended up having like any crazy madness killing people. Spree, spree, but he does hold him. No, back Ajax from, does, but he doesn't. Right, but mm -hmm. Achilles never. I guess he he decimates the Greek army by holding his yeah. power back. That's right. There's a, a narrative pattern in the epics called withdrawal, withdrawal, devastation, and return, and this shows you how necessary the hero is mm -hmm. when he pulls out the thing collapses. He has to come back in, so that is a kind of destructiveness, but other kinds are even more. Uh, direct, more, more obvious. So at, at the basic level of its meaning, I think this heros, this cult figure, is playing the role that René Girard identified of the guy with the knife who kills the, the cow and then has to leave the community. In other words, he comes into the community, kills the bad guys, and rides off into the sunset. I'm, I'm using that language for a specific reason. You know, lest you think that we don't have this myth anymore, da 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 dum dum dum, you know, every Western movie, the guy comes running in, and then he, he uh, you know, rounds up the bad guys, kills them all, and then kisses the woman or the horse, as the case may be, and <laughs> rides off into the sunset. We still have that story. Now, I don't know how recently you've read uh, the apologue, the adventures, but the, the mantic space within the mantic space is book 11, which is called the Nequia, or the journey to the dead. And here, Odysseus goes down into the underworld, sees some of his old friends, some of whom like him, some of them don't like him, there are specific reasons for that. And he manages to invoke the psyche, the spirit of Tiresias, who was one of the most famous of the seers, the mantic people. And Tiresias tells him what's one of the things that's going to happen to him, which is he's going to put a winnowing fan, oh, he's going to put an oar over his shoulder and walk inland till he meets people who don't recognize what an oar is and they think it's a winnowing fan. And uh, this is going to happen to him after he returns to uh, uh, Ithaca. Now, you know, before I really understood what the hero is, what his function is, what he's doing, why this is happening, it was so jarring to me. Here's, you know, de heimkea des Odysseus, the return of Odysseus. 20 years the guy is struggling to come back. 
all this modern Greek poetry about getting back to Ithaca you know, by Kavafi, he finally makes it home and we know he's going to leave again. Why? Because that is his role to take on the violence of the community and leave. He is a scapegoat. And, uh, the, and very costly because society has not yet figured out a way to escape from the sacrificial logic. And uh, Girard's point is that the institution that was invented to help us get out of that was law. And uh, at this point, they didn't have any. Okay. I think that's what Christ tried to do. Was well, he did, what Christ did, and Girard does argue this, is he destroys the whole logic of the sacrifice by being the victim. And uh, uh, Girard's argument is that Job sets this up because the victim, you remember sprinkling the water on the sheep? The victim is supposed to say, you got me, I'm guilty. Do you remember uh, Oedipus? Uh, I'm guilty, don't, don't worry, don't, uh, don't incur any problem, I'll kill myself. <laughs> he blinds himself and he exiles himself. He's a perfect victim. I mean, a victim to die for, so to speak. <laughs> Pardon the pun. Uh, but Job says, you guys can do whatever you want, but I'm not guilty. And when the victim says that, the, the logic is over. You can't carry out sacrifice anymore. So there are other indications also that the Hebrews were very nervous about sacrificial logic and wanted to get rid of it. And this is why Jesus went into the temple and shook things up, because what do they do in the temple? They slaughter animals. Yeah. So he was making an act against violence at its very core. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so this is a very heavy poem, really, and, uh, you know, if you read it sensitively, you cannot come down where people like to come down and say, hooray for Odysseus, he came back, he gets the girl, he saves the society, he kills all the bad guys. Because uh, what would you have to go on? Well, you have these very lame excuses. Odysseus starts killing the suitors. And uh, they come up to him and supplicate him. They put their arm around his knee and hold his beard and say, please don't kill me. And he chooses. You know, it's like Obama sitting there saying, let's take, send a drone out after this guy, but not after this guy. And at one point, he stops killing them. And he says, this will prove to all mankind, now this is important, this will prove to posterity that it's better to be living a life of good rather than a life of evil. Now you tell me, by what criterion are we supposed to understand that not stopping the killing here as opposed to there or there is showing us the difference between good and evil? It's, it's like using the logic of sacrifice itself to vindicate itself. Uh, <clears throat> I had a student one time whose father was in the FBI. <clears throat> Boy, I was really careful in that class. <laughs> <laughs> and he said that his father was on a team of FBI men who were working on a particular problem one time. And the team had a nice group picture. You know, you're just the boys standing around the sacrificial fire pit, I guess. And it happened that J. Edgar Hoover walked by and saw this picture on his desk and looked at that. And J. Edgar said, there's a pinhead in that group. Get him out of there and walked out. Now, for the life of them, they had no idea who he was talking about. But they had to pick one guy and say, you're the pinhead. You're out of the group. Now, what was J. Edgar Hoover doing? He was in reinvigorating sacrificial logic taking a scapegoat and making him pay for the crimes of the whole group. Even he didn't know which one was a pinhead, is my theory. That wasn't the point. The point was to say that we can arbitrarily designate anyone as guilty. I have a question that just struck me as you were talking because mm -hmm. you've been overlapping mm -hmm. the, the crew and the yeah. Um, the suitors, the suitors. Mm -hmm. but when you mentioned that Odysseus is very intentionally choosing to kill, because I like mm -hmm. I, um, 
have never really focused on the, the bloodbath at the end. It's in horrific. In my head, it's all like he just has the bow and he's just like, yeah. you know, die, 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 die. Yeah. But if he's doing it very intentionally like that, um, it almost seems like it might be a, uh, a tacit, <coughs> very subtle way of, in a way, both incriminating but also exonerating Odysseus for mm-hmm. being the real reason that his whole crew died. Because he killed his crew. That's the and point. And if we're overlapping the crew and the suitors, then he's intentionally killing the suitors. Mm-hmm. But then it works backwards also because mm-hmm. he's got a reason to kill the suitors. Mm-hmm. So he's yeah. both incriminating and he, exonerating. The poem tells you that there's a reason for the crew dying also. But uh, the way Homer presents it, you really wonder who's telling the truth here and whether the reason is not in fact being made up after the fact. You know, he, he comes back from these adventures, he's lost all these men, uh, and then he says, well, they perished by their own criminal folly, and, and he describes the sacrifice of Thrinakia and all the other uh, bad things that they did, but they say that he did it to them. And uh, as I say, if Homer were unambiguous one way or the other, that the guy is great and we need his type around here. He, now remember what Horace said about Homer, he qui nil molitur inepte, he never did anything gracelessly. He knew what he was doing every second. If he wanted to, he could have clearly divided the suitors into people who were guilty and the people who were not guilty, have Odysseus spare the latter and kill the former. But all you have is Odysseus's say so. And by this time, that makes me a little uncomfortable. Another kind of lame excuse is uh, after the killing, and I, wow, I hadn't thought of this before. The killing is actually a pretty heavy thing to do to the oikos, right? To the community. To kill off members of your own community, what kind of thing is that? It's a blow against the oikos system. And what happens to it then is it regresses into the family feud system. We have some friends uh, in an organization in Italy known as uh, Operazione Colomba, Operation Dove, who are uh, uh, intervening, nonviolent intervening in four places, and one of them is Albania. Well, what happened is after the horrible wars, the Kosovar Wars, the Catholic Albanians more or less migrated up to the north of the country, and the Muslim Albanians in the south, more or less. And what happens is that the government has control in the south, but not in the north. So you have this whole population of people right across the Adriatic living in a failed state. And so they fell back on the only system that they knew, which is called Gyakmarja, which apparently means blood feud. So you have like close to a third of the men in this region who can't go out of their house because they'll be killed. And my friends are in there trying to, you know, give them a substitute. But the fact is, society has evolved through various stages of organization, each new stage being less violent than the one before. And after Odysseus's attack on his oikos, they relapse into the family feud system, where the relatives of the slain suitors come around to take their revenge. And do uh, you remember the very end of the poem, what it is that uh, resolves that particular battle? And it's just like uh, supposed to look and yeah, amazing. Athena appears. So you have what is actually called a deus ex machina. You can't figure out a way to end the plot. So a god <laughs> pops up and says, okay, call it off, you know, everybody back to you. So considering how skillful the poet is, uh, I find that very a very uh, unsatisfactory, not very convincing conclusion. So I end up thinking, Stephanie, I'm cycling back to your question. 
I end up thinking that the Odyssey is like the Mahabharata. Okay, you may ask me, how is the Odyssey like the Mahabharata? <laughs> well, because if you're a simple person, you can read the Mahabharata as basically a cowboy and Indian's story. Good guys, bad guys, magic weapons, gods popping up, woohoo. You know, <laughs> if you are a deeper person, and you know, who knows how that comes about, but let's say you're a Berkeley undergrad and you have much deeper insight into life. Uh, then, you, then you read the Bhagavad Gita. Then you put together the fact that the Mahabharata winners are you know, almost destroyed, that you know, they've destroyed everything. You read the poem on a much deeper level. So I, I wish I had real, I wish you had asked me that question back in 1990. <laughs> you weren't old enough to probably, but, <laughs> uh, but I now realize that that's ultimately how I now understand the poem, that it has a simple surface. If you don't know any better, you think that Odysseus rescues the community. It's too bad they had to kill all those people, but he tells you they perished by their own folly. He, he tells you that in mythic terms and in real terms, so it must be true. But if you're a more sensitive person, as the poet himself was, you say, my God, this is one hell of a system. Well, the only way we can keep society from destroying itself through blood feuds is by picking one person, pouring all our wealth in him and giving him all of our authority. And you can see in the parts that you read in books 21, 22, it's all about authority. You know, Eumaeus is bringing out the bow. The suitors tell him, what are you doing? You, dogs are going to eat you. Not very nice. Uh, go back. And he drops the bow, ho any koro, in the very spot where he's standing. Telemachus says to him, you cannot obey everybody. You better obey me. Pick up that bow and give it to the beggar. So it's all a struggle for authority that's going on in these disguised terms. <clears throat> okay, I, I guess I'll say two more things, though I could actually say three or four. <laughs> and then uh, we'll, stop, we'll stop here. One thing is that this whole study of mine was launched by a very strange remark that Odysseus makes that nobody, it was so strange that nobody even tried to comment on it. And that is when he, he sheds his arrows out of the quiver on the ground in front of him, he shoots them through the axe heads to prove that he's who he is, not that they understand. And, but then he says, okay, now the aethlos aatos is over. Now I'm going to try a shot that no one has ever tried before. And he shoots Antinous through the neck. Now, what does that mean, a shot that no one has ever tried before? Well, one scholar said, well, no one ever shot Antinous before. Okay, okay <laughs> come on, give me a break. This is a serious poem. <laughs> it happens that 100 lines before this scene, before this very utterance, you have what's known technically as an etiological myth. That means a foundation myth. And you tell a story and you say, that's why we do thus and so. We eat bitter herbs on this night because our ancestors had to cross the desert and so on. Now that's one that's come almost up into historical terms, times, so it, it's a little bit odd, but almost all your institutions are grounded in a myth which is told as if it happened on a particular time. So we're, you're primed to read this as a foundation myth. And what is it founding? What is a foundation myth for? This is the 64 drachma question. <laughs> to explain why? It's a, you? here's what I think. I think it's a foundation myth for the ultimate sanction of violence as a means of, restore, of preserving order in the community. That's where he is now killing his all, own. All etiological myths are. are no, this particular, particular myth. Particular yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. This particular one, he says, I am now founding in, in a, okay, we could paraphrase it this way. Odyssey says, okay, enough for the game. Now we're having a real fight. So that he's going from sacrificial ritual to actual murder. And uh, we could say a lot more about that, but okay, now we're going from a game to an actual fight. And I am now going to establish the practice of the use of le uh, ultimate violence to restore order in the community. And by the way, whose order? I, I mean, there, there is no indication that Odysseus was elected or designated to be the ruling family in Ithaca. He just is. So that's why there's all of this strain to, to ground it in some kind of authority. It's like almost frantically trying to say, you can't obey everybody, so obey this man, and that'll keep us together. And if we don't obey him, he will kill us. And that's, that's what's keeping society together. And I'm sorry, it's not a very pretty picture, but uh, that's what was going on at that time. So today, when we use the ultimate sanction of violence and the reason why the United States will not give up uh, capital punishment is because it feels that its moral compass is out of whack and our authority is being undermined. Uh, you know, things that were never supposed to happen are happening. You know, we are torturing people. People are killing Americans, hating us things are falling apart. So we get desperate to reground our authority. And we do it by going back several thousand years instead of by going forward uh, into a nonviolent resolution. That's why it's so critically important to try to substitute restorative justice for retributive justice, because it would secretly without them realizing it, it would take away their code for violence. They would still probably be violent, but they wouldn't be so secure about it and it would be easier to uh, get rid of it. Okay, so because of Stephanie's question, the other one about the feminism, I want to just mention one other thing. And that is a scene in book 21. Uh, excuse me one second. Yeah, line 330 to 342, if you have line numbers in your translation. Uh, Penelope gets the idea of, uh, well, uh, of using Odysseus's bow for a bow test. This is in Sanskrit epic. They had a name for this. It's called a Svayamvara, or your own choice, where a, a, a princess would get to choose from princes and kings whom she wanted to marry. And in fact, it was usually about springing, stringing a bow. That's what happens in the Ramayana. Mm -hmm. You know, all these heroes get up and try to string the bow of Shiva. They can't even budge it. Rama gets up and he goes, oops, I broke it by mistake. <laughs> uh, so the contest is about to go forward and Penelope comes and stands on the balustrade with her two serving maids, never appears alone, always two serving maids, one on either side. And when the suitors see her, their knees turn to jelly and they're all overcome by lust. Not that, as I said, you know, this poem is not about romance. <laughs> uh, the parallel in mantic space is when Odysseus's men get turned into pigs by Circe. Anyway, that happens. And then Penelope comes up with an astounding idea, which to my knowledge, nobody had noticed the significance of. She says, I have an idea. Actually, she doesn't just say that. She just, she says, this uh, beggar here, he's pretty well built, you know? <laughs> look, at, look at the guy. I say, give him the bow, let him try his luck. And if he, if he wins, we'll give him a lot of gifts and send him on his way. So what she is offering is conflict resolution. And it's not a coincidence that she is a woman. And what is Telemachus's reaction? He says, Mom, you have your work. 
and I have mine. Go upstairs, weave more cloth for the oikos. And then he has, he has two lines. He says, authority belongs with the men and especially with me because I can order the women. That, it's unusual in Homer where you have two lines that are absolutely identical in a row. And this happens four times, three times in the Iliad and one time in the Odyssey. And this is the ultimate um, bid for authority by a male hero. And notice how sacrificial it is. I'm better than all you guys because we can both push out the women. So even that has a kind of sacrificial logic to the scapegoat is uh, whatever women are, are present. So uh, three things are going on here. Four, I think, by latest count. Uh, Penelope tries to exert her authority, which would lead to peace. Telemachus says, no, this is a man's world. We're going to have war. Uh, she recurs to the strange story that Tiresias had told that Odysseus would leave after he got back to Ithaca because that's what the hero does. And she tries to uh, deflect the slaughter that's coming up, which she seems to know about. She's had a terrible dream about the slaughter, if you remember, and that was, the dream was that all her pet geese got killed by a hawk or a vulture. And clearly, I mean, if you know anything about dreams, she is foretelling the death of the suitors. And what that says is she, she doesn't hate them. You know, she's angry at them for eating her biotos up and all of that. But, you know, they're the young men and she's the matriarch of the whole community. So she's actually trying to deflect the violence and uh, Telemachus won't stand for it. And it's also, he, Telemachus is making a bid for being the head of the Oikos, which is, if you know about another myth called the Oedipus story, <laughs> is a wee bit scary there also. So Odysseus does what he does at the 11th hour and the 59th minute, because Telemachus, you can just see that he's just about to grow a beard and stepping up into manhood. He's gone off on a trip by himself. He's called a meeting of the Agora, the council, and uh, he's told Eumaeus what to do. And if it were not for the fact that he puts on all this armor and jumps up on the, the udos, the flooring next to his father and says, OK, Dad, I'm with you. Let's go. Um, there would be another serious authority issue in the poem. So the poem is about the fact that struggles for power and authority are terrible. They are costly. They they kill, they divide us against one another, but without authority, it'd be even worse. You know, we would just regress into pretty much what's going on in Mexico today and what's going on in uh, South Sudan. Okay, well, I sort of feel a natural stopping place here. It's on a high note. It's on a, yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That was the sweetheart, yeah. <laughs> I have a quick yeah. Side, yeah. That it's, it's ultimately in the hands of the gods. You know, it acts, that's a very good point, Lucy. And what it reminds me of is a science fiction film that is said to be a classic film. And I have a friend who will not stop talking about this film, which is why I don't give him my email address anymore. <laughs> but it's called uh, The Day the World Stood Still, or The Day the Earth Stood Still, something like that. In that film, which is at the height of the Cold War, in the early 50s, everybody is terrified that one, one glass of vodka too many or one glass of uh, whiskey too many and somebody could run down and push the wrong button, that would be the end of uh, the world as we know it. We want to destroy it on our own terms, differently. Uh, and so, slowly. slowly, yeah. So what happens in that film? Invulnerable, p 
powers with absolute power from outer space come down to Earth and say, make peace. And all these Russians and Americans say, oh, okay, if you say so. <laughs> but it strikes me that the end of the Odyssey is very much like that. Mm -hmm. And it's very unsatisfactory. You could say the gods want us to make peace, so let's do it. Or you could say we don't have, it's not possible for human beings to live at peace. We need a divine intervention. So. But then if you think about what, like the optimistic Gnostics, right? Mm -hmm. We all have that little divine spark in us. Yes. So then, because we're living in a different age, yeah. where things are, mm -hmm. you know, we have a reflective kind of consciousness. Yeah. So that means then that the divine part of each of us That's is right. part that makes peace. That's exactly right. And as we were coming over here, uh, you may, some of you probably know that uh, Stephanie has a new feature on our website called the Daily Meta, where she takes a line from Gandhi, or a line, I'm still back in Homer. <laughs> she, she takes a quote from Gandhi and writes some commentary on that. They've been very, very successful, and they're on our website, metacenter.org. Um, and so we were talking about various Gandhi quotes on the way over here, and I was thinking of Ishran's uh, favorite quote, which is on the flyleaf of his book, where Gandhi said, I have not the shadow of a doubt that any man or woman can do what I have done if they cultivate the same singleness of purpose and the same faith. But that is way post-Homeric. <laughs> if, if a Greek person were to say, oh, I think I'm Zeus, uh, <laughs> Their insurance policy would run out. <laughs> you know, if you would say this would be a height of insanity for them. So it, it shows you that uh, I don't think that you could ask for people to be more brilliant, to have more uh, profound poetic tradition, but still human consciousness is evolving and we are knowing things about ourselves now that it would be very difficult to know in the ancient world. Because whenever you felt something stirring in yourself, you projected it outward as a myth. And I, th I think, uh, I, I don't know if anybody would be believe me or not, but I think one of the reasons that Christianity prevailed over all the other exciting religions that were going on at that time, there were uh, many of them being a lot more fun, <laughs> The reason it prevailed was that it had developed a vocabulary for describing inner experiences. Mm -hmm. And the other religious systems did not. And that's exactly what people were interested in knowing about themselves at that time. So, for example, prior to Augustine, voluntas means an act of will. After Augustine, it means the capacity to will, the will in the modern sense. You're very welcome. Thank you, Lucy. Oh, thank you, thank you.